Have you ever looked at what Hollywood passes for aliens and found yourself a little disappointed? Of course, the practicality of special effects necessitates that they look pretty much like weird humans. But if you consider the billions of years of evolution and the many coincidences that it took for us to look like this, it starts to feel a little bit unbelievable. I think it's a real shame that even when alien ecosystems are presented in media, they always rely on the same familiar tropes, like insect aliens or squid aliens or other kinds of spiced up earth life. I think we can do better than that. Welcome to the first episode of this new series, where we're going to be following the evolution of an alien biosphere all the way until the development of intelligent life. And if we've done our job correctly, it should look bizarre and miraculous. I also want this series to be a one-stop shop for all of your alien life world building needs. So I'm going to be covering the biological principles that I'm using at every step of the process. And hopefully you can follow along. One thing I'm not going to be covering is the planet building process. Uh, it's really not my cup of tea, and so I would probably be making a lot of mistakes and doing everyone a disservice. But I can't recommend enough channels like Artifexian, who has great tutorials on anything from building your stars to building your planets to the geological features on those planets. It's really incredible. He'll be linked in the description. And with that, let's begin. And where better to begin than at the very start of our alien biosphere's natural history, with the evolution of the first ever life on our planet. Now, before we can create life on our alien planet, we should probably know how it happened on Earth. On Earth, the prevailing theory is something called abiogenesis, in which life capable of evolution comes from inorganic or dead matter. The processes for how exactly this happened are a little bit shrouded in mystery, but I'm going to be giving you my best interpretation of what I understand the science to be. Fundamentally, all life requires three basic things in order to be able to do what life does. The first of these is some kind of storage of information. This is going to be DNA in our case, but it could be anything else. And all that this really allows is for evolution to happen in the first place. Because if information can be passed on, it can mutate, and so natural selection can take place. Assuming, of course, that that information can affect the rest of the cell. And now this is where the second part of life comes in, the second fundamental building block. And that is some kind of chemical activity where the life is capable of taking one chemical and turning it into another or taking a chemical and using it for some purpose of self-replication. That is the second component. And the third fundamental building block of life is some kind of membrane that allows all of these chemical reactions to be contained within a manageable space. So how did these three fundamental building blocks of life come about on Earth, starting from just dead chemicals? Well, uh, amino acids and simple RNA can come about very easily in the conditions of ancient Earth. This was proved, for example, in the Miller-Urey experiment, where they electrified a bunch of boiling water and ammonia and resulted in a bunch of amino acids. This is a very interesting experiment. You can read about it on Wikipedia. So the theory that I personally subscribe to is something called RNA world. In RNA world, the early primordial ocean was filled with these folded RNAs, which were capable of uh, performing self-replication through some kind of uh, chemical process. And this, in a way, combines the second and first fundamental building blocks of life into one molecule, which is a very good start. And so these folded RNAs, which were capable of producing more of themselves, uh, would have been the first kind of self-replicating organism. These folded RNAs could become more efficient if they bundled up together in a kind of production line to create more of themselves faster. In a way, this already is enough to be considered some kind of life and to undergo Darwinian evolution. But it's still very simple, and it has the fundamental flaw that it is incapable of controlling its chemical environment. And this is where the membrane comes in. So along with the amino acids and RNA that already exists in the water, there are also these chemicals called phospholipids. And phospholipids have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. And what that means is that they are prone to spontaneously organizing into these kinds of bubbles that enclose spaces of water and forming a kind of spontaneous membrane, essentially. One of the most versatile versions of this is something called a lipid bilayer. Lipid bilayers are truly incredible. Without any additional cellular machinery, they have been observed to grow, divide, and even aid polymerization reactions. So these things by themselves are already capable of some of the processes of life 
even with no extra machinery. And so now we have something that is capable of enclosing space and something that needs an enclosed space, and they exist within the same primordial ocean. Of course, RNA that was able to find itself in these phospholipid bilayer bubbles was more successful because it had more control over its chemical environment. And over time, it would have evolved to expand its own lipid bilayer and grow more of these little bubbles that contain only itself. This is, by all definitions, life. But you'll notice that so far we've only been talking about RNA. The RNA to DNA transition is a little bit more hazy. I have not been able to find any good explanations on this, but it is most probable that DNA is just a better storage method than RNA. RNA is just a single strand, it's a little bit unstable. DNA forms these very kind of uh, solid structures that then can store information more permanently. And with that, we've created LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. On Earth, the LUCA is expected to have lived about 3.7 billion years ago. Some push it back to 4.4, but essentially it would have come about almost immediately after the first more permanent bodies of water settled down on the planet. The last universal common ancestor was extremely simple. It was just some DNA in a little membrane that would have contained some small proteins and would have probably fed passively to break down organic molecules in the water around it. One of the more complicated features that it probably did have is these structures called pili, which help it attach to surfaces, but are also used in bacteria for horizontal gene transfer. It's still unclear exactly where the last universal common ancestor lived or actually what it metabolized. The most popular theory is that this uh, last universal common ancestor lived around geothermal vents, which makes a lot of sense. These thermal vents have a lot of nutrients going around. They have very hot conditions. It's a big kind of chemical soup where a lot of reactions can happen. And at the early Earth, it would have been much more common to see these things around because the Earth was that much more volcanically active at the time. So it makes a lot of sense that this is where it could have lived, but this is still up for debate in the scientific community. So now that we understand the path that life on Earth took to get to its last universal common ancestor, we can start to speculate. What can we change? What had to happen the way that it did? And what could happen differently in our speculative alien biosphere? Well, for that, let's take a look at each of these components step by step. Starting with membranes, membranes will mostly depend on the liquid solvent in which your organisms are living. So in water, phospholipids are simply just the best option. They have these incredible properties even when they are just on their own without any other kind of chemical support structure. Like I mentioned before, they're able to grow, divide. It's just the most likely that if you have a water solvent based life form that you will have phospholipid based membranes. There are others in methane, for example, you will not get phospholipid membranes because the solvent is nonpolar. And so phospholipids don't really have any kind of repulsion or attraction to it. But there are equivalent chemicals in most solvents. So in methane, you have a chemical called uh, acrylonitrile, which is able to form these other chemicals known as azotosomes that can then form these kinds of layers even in an otherwise nonpolar solvent. Keep in mind that the methane boiling point is minus 160 degrees Celsius, and so your life will be very, very cold if you choose to set it in a methane solvent, but it is also theoretically possible that these membranes form. Now, I think this is a great time to say that I am going to only be focusing on water-based life in this series, water-based carbon life specifically, because anything else is just too theoretical and it would have no scientific backing and it would be mostly just speculation. And while it's super interesting and it's a shame that I can't cover it, I think it's best if we stick to something that is more applicable and scientifically grounded. But now let's move on to our information storage. This is a completely different story than the membranes. We have so much room to work with here and almost nothing is set in stone. It was mostly created by coincidence on Earth. So when we're talking about the information storage systems that we have on Earth, we're mostly talking about RNA and DNA. Both of these have certain things in common. They're both based on a backbone, in this case, a deoxyribose backbone, 
which is sugar molecules connected by phosphates. And then there are nucleotides, which actually encode the information that are attached to this backbone. Already here, there are a ton of possibilities. For example, the backbone does not necessarily have to be deoxyribose. There can be uh, other sugars or other kinds of structures that are connected as long as they make one long polymer. The problem here is that there hasn't been a lot of research done into what properties exactly these polymers would have. And so it's not necessarily going to be as stable or good at its job as DNA is, or it's not even necessarily known what shapes it will form. For example, DNA is in this very iconic double helix shape, which might not be the case for other types of backbones. One backbone that I found particularly interesting was peptide nucleic acid, which has a lot of research done on it and is actually more stable than DNA. And it forms very, very interesting bonds, which are much stronger. It's also a good example of how you're actually able to mix and match backbones, because as it turns out, a peptide backbone and a deoxyribose backbone are also compatible and can create the same double helix shape and be much more stable than DNA currently is. So this is interesting. It also means that DNA is in some way suboptimal. And what that means for us is that we have a lot of leeway when it comes to experimenting with different storage systems for biological information. Because nature doesn't really look for perfection, it looks for good enough. And if DNA is good enough, despite being suboptimal, it stands to reason that there are a lot of other structures that would meet the criterion of good enough. Now that we've talked about the backbone, let's also address the nucleotides. In our DNA, you have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine as the uh, four bases, and they form base pairs, which is uh, essentially the combinations of these two that are capable of bonding together. For example, adenine and cytosine will never be able to form a base pair, and so adenine can only pair with thymine. Here's the interesting thing. These do not have to be the way that they are. Even on Earth, in RNA, the thymine is actually uracil. It's not the same chemical, which means that we can technically have any kind of bases or any kind of system of nucleotides so long as they do form these base pairs and are not compatible with the other one. That should give you an idea of how arbitrary all of this is. Now, I will say that all of this flexibility does come with a little bit of a caveat. RNA is necessary for abiogenesis to have happened in the first place. It's called the RNA world hypothesis. So something like RNA, which is capable of being both an information storage and a chemical agent, is necessary for the initial start of life. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your DNA, which on Earth is kind of a modified version of RNA, it doesn't mean that your version of DNA on your planet has to be in any way related to that RNA. Because RNA can itself form very complex chemical systems, and so it stands to reason that this RNA can also build very strange organic compounds capable of storing information. And so while I don't know enough chemistry to come up with anything super creative, I'm sure that there would be a lot of people out there that are capable of coming up with some truly bizarre uh, information storage system, and all of those would still be valid. So we have a lot of options when it comes to the chemical structure of our life forms. But before we can really start making our decisions, we have to understand a little bit about the planet that all of this is taking place on. So because I want to make this series as applicable as possible, I'm setting it on a sister planet to Earth that I'm calling Noterra. This planet will have very, very similar characteristics to our own planet. Now, this will help to avoid any kind of unexpected geochemical or physical effects on the life that I might not be able to anticipate. And so it'll help to keep our life forms more scientifically plausible. And with that, let's start building our last universal common ancestor. The first thing we're going to want to decide is what kind of membrane are we using? In my case, because these are water-based life forms, they live in a water solvent lipid layers will be pretty much standard and they'll probably evolve in this lineage as well even on this alien planet our first deviation from earth life will be the dna structure that this creature has instead of dna our alien life forms will use gna or glyconucleic acid this uses glycol sugars in its backbone instead of the deoxyribose sugars that are used in earth's life forms 
Now I'm going to add a feature to this last universal common ancestor that might be a little bit controversial. On Earth, both bacteria and archaea have cell walls, almost universally. But while in bacteria they are made out of peptidoglycan, in archaea they are made of other chemicals that are sometimes called pseudopeptidoglycans. What that means is that these were evolved independently, and the LUCA on Earth did not have a cell wall. However, the cell wall evolved independently twice, and so it's fair to say that it will probably emerge in unrelated lineages, even on an alien planet. And so, to simplify things, I've decided to give my last universal common ancestor a cell wall as well. What the cell wall does is it helps the microorganism to maintain its shape, it protects it from outside elements, and it allows it to osmoregulate more effectively. Now, the cell wall in my microorganism is going to be based on polysaccharides. This is very similar to the pseudopeptidoglycans in uh, archaea and to the cell walls in plant cells. But you don't have to adhere so closely to earth biology. You could, for example, have silica incorporated into this cell wall as in a kind of composite. Or you could have some other kind of maybe fatty cell wall that is made to be more waterproof. You could also potentially have the wall sandwiched between two lipid layers, or you could not have a cell wall at all and instead just have more lipid layers. There are a lot of different ways that you can take this that don't necessarily comply with what happened on Earth. Speaking of convergent evolution with Earth, my universal common ancestor will also have pili. The reason that I think these would evolve very readily in almost all biospheres is that they are just very useful. They help the cell to attach itself to surfaces, and they are relatively easy to evolve once you have a membrane. That being said, it doesn't necessarily have to look like this. In your last universal common ancestor, they could, for example, secrete a kind of adhesive chemical uh, onto their membrane, which would have the same function. Or you could potentially have a rougher cell wall which causes friction with surfaces that it encounters, also potentially allowing the cell to grip onto any surfaces. So once again, a lot of options. Next we're going to move on to the ribosomes. Almost all life anywhere will have some equivalent to ribosomes, because what ribosomes do is they convert RNA signals into proteins. They are essentially the things that build proteins. And so that's a very important function that any cell will have. It's converting storage information into active chemical processes. And that's critical. So there will be an equivalent to a ribosome. It won't be structured like a ribosome on Earth, but we'll call it a ribosome for simplicity. Finally, the energy producing structures that are going to be present in my last universal common ancestor are not going to be attached to the cell wall like they are in some Earth phyla. For example, on Earth, in mitochondria, the energy-producing structures are attached to the membrane in such a way that in order to get more of them, the membrane has had to become bent and folded inside the mitochondria in order to increase the surface area. On this alien planet, the energy-producing structures of the first microorganisms will float around the cytoplasm freely and will not be attached to the cell wall. And now with that, we've created our last universal common ancestor. This is the cell that will serve as a blueprint for all future life on this alien planet. You might be asking yourself, what does this really affect? Well, to be honest, not much, because we're not focusing on the miniature chemical details for the rest of this series. If we were, we would see just how very, very different this life is because of the changes that we've made. But we want to focus on the evolution of this planet's animal equivalents, not necessarily the microbe world. So this is just going to be the first step in the journey. In the next episode, I'm going to be discussing how our cell differentiates into an entire prokaryotic ecosystem. Until then, goodbye, and see you next time.